so let's look at uh, part three of the discourse on method. Uh, part three is kind of an interlude, I think. Um, and it's a really the, the, the very, very important material to come is in part four. Uh, but part three is very interesting for a couple of reasons um, and wor well worth reading because it sheds some light, I think, on the important uh, philosophical aspects of the discourse. Uh, number one, you know, so where is he in part three? It's very autobiographical. And um, remember, he has decided not to accept any of his opinions as true unless they are absolutely clear and distinct. And he has, in part two, right, has laid out his method for seeking truth, for conducting his reason well. And, and as we see in part three, he does begin to apply it in, in, in certain ways. Um, he says on page 17, uh, bottom page 16, and just as in tearing down an old house, one usually saves the wreckage for use in building a new one. Similarly, in destroying all those opinions of mine that I judged to be poorly founded, I made various observations and acquired many experiences that have since served me in establishing more certain opinions. Moreover, I continue to practice the method. He's given us the method I had prescribed for myself. For besides taking care generally to conduct all my thoughts according to its rules, from time to time I set aside some hours that I spent particularly in applying it to mathematical problems. So he does work in mathematics. I think science he mentions too. Very interested in natural sciences, we'll see. So he's applying the method, but in a very sort of limited way. And I remember that he has decided to put aside, to start over again, this architectural thing, rebuild the foundations. And what he arrives at, sort of in his life, is very similar to what Sextus Empiricus called the mental suspense or suspension of judgment, where we don't know if what we think is true, so we suspend our judgment about it. And just as uh, Sextus uh, realized that living in such suspense required one to keep on living, even though one didn't know anything to really to be true, uh, and required a criterion. Remember, there were two senses of criterion in Sexus Empiricus. The, the, the sense that we focused on was the second sense of a criterion of truth, that is a criterion in the sense of a standard of reference for deciding upon what things were true and what things were false. But the first sense of criterion that he talks about is the ones that skeptics adopt in order to go on living. Criterion in the sense of a standard to live by. And you'll remember that he said, you know, the, the, the customs of the country, uh, constraint of the passions, and uh, the uh, arts, the, the results of the, of, of the arts and sciences. And it's funny that uh, Descartes says some of the very same things, um, these maxims that he'll live by while he's still in the process of rebuilding his knowledge on a sure and certain foundation. The first one on page 13, the first was to obey the laws and customs of my country, constantly holding on to the religion in which by God's grace I had been instructed from my childhood. Very similar to the criterion of skeptics which is a little bit ironic since Descartes has some really bad things to say about uh, skeptics. Um, but he seems to be following not only philosophically, but also ethically. Sexist Empiricus, classical skeptic. And, and other maxims too. Uh, on page 14, my second maxim was to be as firm and resolute in my actions as I could and to follow the most doubtful opinions once I had decided on with no less constancy than if they had been very well assured, that notion that, you know, if you're lost in the woods, it's better to keep on walking in one direction than to continually change your mind and end up walking in circles, I guess. That it would be better to be resolute than to be constantly changing one's opinion, even if you don't know anything to be really true. And the third maxim, uh, bottom of page 14, my third maxim was always to try to conquer myself rather than fortune and to change my desires rather than the order of the world. While that goes very far back as an ethical maxim in the history of Western philosophy, it's actually Stoicism, which to my mind is very closely related to ancient skepticism. And maybe you've read or heard of a philosopher named Epicurus. He said much the same thing, you conquer yourself in order to achieve peace and happiness rather than thinking to 
change the world. Uh, so these are, you know, not original, by the way. I mean, none of them, really. I mean, these are just the things that he decided upon to live by in a sort of provisional way as he got his thoughts in order, as he, he rebuilt that foundation. And he does apply the method, the method for finding truth. And, um, he does say he applies it in his, especially in his uh, mathematics. Uh, and he begins to develop a kind of reputation for being a philosopher being a man of wisdom, being a man of accomplishment, intellectual accomplishment. And he, you know, knows that you should be very careful when people <laughs> begin to think a lot of you, you know, Socrates said, you should really suspect yourself then. Um, so what has he not done? I mean, what is he waiting for? I mean, he's applying these maxims and he's applying the method, the method for finding truth, for conducting run, one's reason well. But what is it, the sense that he's putting something off? But what is he putting off? He's putting off philosophy. However great a, a mathematician Descartes was and will be remembered by, and however ambitious a scientist he was, he's not usually thought of as being quite a successful natural scientist, although he took that very, very seriously and spent a lot of time talking about it. Uh, I'm in no position, by the way, to, qualify, to uh, evaluate the success of Cartesian science. But that's the impression I got. Uh, but he's a philosopher at heart. And what does he put off? Uh, well, I think he's put off applying the method to metaphysics, to philosophy, first philosophy, philosophy at its most basic level, which is questions about what is real, about who I am, about the, what the world is like, about the connection between me and the world. Very, very difficult and fundamental question. And by his own admission, he says in earlier, part one or part two, I can't remember, that uh, science and mathematics too borrow, they borrow the principles from philosophy. That is, um, the principles of science and mathematics are not themselves part of scientific and mathematical study. They are first principles, and therefore, if they're going to be evaluated, they're going to be evaluated by philosophy, not by math or science itself. So, we can't, the point is that we can't really be sure of the soundness of our mathematical. Our philosoph or excuse me, scientific reasoning, without doing a philosophical examination, critique, and evaluation of the first principles of those things. And that's what he's put on. So he says on page 17, the beginning of the second paragraph, nevertheless, those nine years slipped by before I had as yet taken any stand regarding the difficulties commonly debated among learned men, or had begun to seek the foundations of any philosophy that was more certain than the commonly accepted. That's what he's got to do. He's got to ask himself, not only just apply the method in a limited way, science and math. Heck up. Move that way. Move that way and you get out of the picture. Go ahead, go ahead. But he's got to do the philosophical work uh, necessary in order to actually you know, apply the method at its most basic level, at its most foundational Excuse me. And that's what he's going to be doing in 